All right. Well, it is the top of the hour, and we're going to go ahead and get started for today. I'd like to welcome everyone to the American Floral Endowment webinar series for thrips and botrytis research. We are pleased to announce two new sessions in the series this fall, which will be presented first in English. The Spanish session will be October 21st and 26th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Links will be provided in the chat, so please check your chat today to uh, find those Spanish session links. Today's session is on Magnificent Marigolds, a plant-mediated system to enhance Thrips IPM. I'm your webinar host, Dr. Garrett Owen, Assistant Professor of Greenhouse and Controlled Environments at the University of Kentucky. Today, we'll be hearing from Margaret Skinner, Research Professor at the University of Vermont. Today's session will be presented live in English. Following the presentation, we will have time for a Q&A session. We ask that you submit any questions through either the Q&A chat feature or the chat feature at the bottom right of your screen. We will answer as many questions before the end of the hour. I'd like to note that these sessions are live and are exclusively for the supporters of the Thrips and Botrytis Research Fund. The series is being recorded and will be released to the public in 2022. These presentations and materials are copyrighted and should not be distributed or published without AFE's written permission. Next slide, please. AFE is the national nonprofit organization that funds scientific research to identify and solve challenges within the floriculture industry. In 2021, AFE is celebrating 60 years of providing for the future of floral. In 2017, after listening to important industry feedback, AFE established a special research fund to aggressively address the control and management of botrytis and thrips. This campaign has produced several webinars and vital information for our supporters. Past webinars can be found on our YouTube and more information can be found at endowment.org. Again, that is endowment.org. Next slide, please. The American Floral Endowment and all researchers would like to thank all the organizations who have made contributions in support of this important initiative. Today's speaker is Margaret Skinner. She is a research professor and extension entomologist at the University of Vermont Entomology Research Laboratory, where she has worked for 37 years conducting research on management of insect pests in forests, vegetables, and greenhouse ornamentals. Her current primary target pests are western flower thrips and greenhouse ornamentals and aphids in high tunnel vegetables. She works on developing strategies to maximize the potential of insect killing fungi and plant mediated systems. In addition to her IPM work, she established the North American Center for Saffron Research and Development to support an, in, excuse me, to support an emerging saffron industry in North America. The center aims to encourage crop diversification to strengthen revenues of small farmers nationally. Thousands of growers are now producing saffron because of their efforts. Margaret, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Garrett. I appreciate uh, everybody for coming today. Uh, Let's just move on. Uh, the University of Vermont Entomology Research Lab. We're in a little tiny state. Vermont is, uh, in terms of population, the second least populated state in the US. And um, even though we're small, we like to call ourselves a brave little state. Um, the, our entomology lab is made up of four senior scientists and several technicians, and our goal really is to address growers' practical pest problems. Uh, Western flower thrips are a primary focus for us, and the reason why is because it's been such a major problem for growers. Um, we also do a lot of work on insect-killing fungi, specifically Bovaria bassiana. <clears throat> We have worked on Western Flower Thrips IPM for 30 years. You might say, well, how come you haven't fixed it yet? And I'd have to say in Vermont and some of the New England states where we have worked very closely with growers, thrips aren't a big problem for them anymore. And some of that is because they've uh, adopted some of the techniques that I will be talking about today. 
So to be able to manage any pest, you have to know the life cycle. And probably all of you on some level know uh, about the life cycle, but I just need to make sure, and it's complicated. And historically, growers only would spray insecticides on the foliage, and they wondered why they didn't get good treatment effect. Well, one of the reasons is because the pupae oftentimes hide in the soil, and even the larval stage drops to the soil. And so there was a whole phase of this insect's life cycle that escaped uh, exposure to chemical pesticides. So some of the real problems are they hide in tight places, which makes pesticides really hard to, to get to them. Uh, they reproduce quickly. And just to give you an appreciation, one female can lay 150 to 300 eggs. And often in your greenhouse, 60 to 90 percent of all the thrips that you see are female. The, it, the insect goes from the egg to the adult stage in seven to 14 days. And technically, one female that lays 100 eggs, within 20 days, you have 10,000 um, insects to deal with. So what's a grower to do? <clears throat> so when we develop uh, pest management strategies, we do it with the grower in mind. And for us, these are the, the keys to success. We got to keep it simple. We got to keep it easy. It's got to be cheap. It's got to be quick for you to do. And it's got to be effective. It's hard to find something that does all of those things. And I'm gonna talk about marigolds as one part of a total integrated pest management strategy. And just to cut to the chase, I am hoping that by the time we're finished with this presentation, you will go right out and buy some marigold seeds to give it a try. Then I will know that we have been successful. <clears throat> okay, so what are plant mediated IPM systems? Um, basically, it sounds much more complicated than it is. They're plants that are used in different pest suppression tactics for IPM. So there's lots of different types. I'm only going to be talking about marigolds today, but here are a couple of other examples. So they can be used as indicator plants or trap plants. And on the left hand side of your screen, you can see uh, green beans that are very effective against uh, spider mite. The spider mites love them more than uh, tomatoes. Um, uh, Gerbia daisies and <clears throat> or eggplants and tomatoes can work very well against white fly in terms of attracting them out of the crop. And again, there are several different kinds of plants that are used very effectively against uh, Western flower thrips, marigolds, uh, chrysanthemums, and even alyssum. And the alyssum in particular is more of a habitat plant where you're trying to encourage a whole environment that is suitable for the natural enemies that you want to attract into your crop. Okay. Now, so why are marigolds so great? First, I'd say, you know, you might say, well, there's lots of plants that are attractive to thrips. What's so darn good about marigolds? Well, obviously thrips love them when they're in flower. They're really easy to grow. They come to flower in 30 days, even in short days. The seed is pretty cheap and relatively easy to get. The flowers produce pollen, which is critical for the survival of parasites and predators, and they don't harbor serious diseases. It's what's not to like. <clears throat> So you might say, well, which marigolds do you use? There's lots of different types. We have done some testing on that, thanks to support from the American Floral Endowment. And after all of the research that we've done, we find that Hero Yellow, the dwarf double flower French cultivar is the best. And that's because it produces lots of flowers all season long, which is really important. There's some growers that really like the single flower disc yellow they say it's easier to see thrips. Uh, we like the hero yellow double flower dwarf, but you can try different ones. Don't feel like it's a rigid thing that doesn't allow for flexibility. We tested a bunch of other ones in the past, Antigua yellow, for example, 
Um, it had too few flowers over time. And we wanted these marigolds to last for at least 12 weeks in the crop. Lemon gem was a beautiful little um, plant, but um, it tended to break off when we, uh, uh, when we would, uh, about, uh, when we would tap them to see if the thrips were there. Some people have asked us, well, what about orange or red ones? Can't we use those? And yeah, you can use them. They're attractive too, but really the yellow seemed to work better than anything. <clears throat> okay, so do marigolds really work? Do they, do they really trap indicator as a, do they really work as a trap plant or an indicator plant? And so I just wanted to show you this one graph, which blows my mind. So all you need to see is this is over a 12 week period. <clears throat> um, and we looked at the number of thrips on random crop plants and on marigolds. And, and you don't even need to look at the numbers. What you can see clearly is <clears throat> Um, all the thrips were on the marigolds. They weren't on the crop plants, even after 12 weeks. That is incredible. Even by 12 weeks, there were even flowers uh, among the crop plants. And so it shows that it is, the marigolds are really effective at uh, luring the thrips out of the crop. 95% of all the thrips that we saw in this trial were on the marigolds, not on the crop plants. The other thing that we found was that thrips were commonly found two weeks earlier on marigolds than they were on yellow sticky traps. Now everybody uses yellow sticky traps and that's fine and that's wonderful or maybe they use blue ones, but um, it, what it shows is the marigolds work even better in general. <clears throat> okay, so how do you use them? So this is the key. You gotta plant them early so that they are ready when you need them uh, either before you put uh, plants, your crop plants in. Uh, so if you do that, um, you can clean up the greenhouse. It's very common in, in our region that um, thrips can hide in the folds of plastic. And so when you start heating up the greenhouse that's been fallow for a couple of months, um, when you start heating up the greenhouse, the thrips start coming out. And if all they have is a marigold to go to, they'll go there. And then you can, after you start getting all the thrips out of there, you bag up the plant and get rid of it. Alternatively, like in the picture on the right here, um, you can put the marigolds right within the crop. Doesn't, one of the things we like about some of these marigold species, they don't take up a lot of space. We generally recommend one plant per thousand square feet and it's important or it's ideal to put these marigolds in place before the crop flowers. So, and it's also a good idea to raise them up above, you can see in this marigold, it's on a, another pot so that it's actually above the, uh, the crop plants so that when the thrips are moving around, they're gonna come to the marigold first, they'll see that first. Um, you gotta. You can't just put them in the in the greenhouse and then walk away. You really need to monitor them regularly um, to see if if you actually have thrips in your greenhouse and whether you need to take action against them. If for some reason the plant gets too infested and you're concerned that maybe the thrips will move out from that plant to the crop, get rid of them. Bag them up and get rid of them. <clears throat> it's also a good idea. Uh, oops, sorry, I just, uh, let me just go back. Um, every now and then you need to trim them, trim the flowers a little bit so that that stimulates more flowering. But the bottom line is do what works for you. And what works for you may be different from what works for another grower. <clears throat> so you gotta sort of tweak this to make it work for yourself. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about uh, variations on the theme of marigolds. So initially, we just use marigolds as a trap plant um, or as an indicator plant. But the trouble is growers, they didn't want to have to replace the marigold regularly. So we thought, huh, if we can attract the thrips to that marigold and then apply natural enemies or biological control agents, maybe we can make that trap 
plant work as a guardian plant so that once the thrips come, then we can um, get rid of them right on that plant. Okay, so this is how it works. So we call it attract, sustain, and kill. So for this trial, we had this marigold, the hero yellow marigold. We put sachets of a predatory mite called Nocelis cucumeris, which is commonly used uh, as a predator uh, against thrips. They um, reproduce well on marigolds because if there aren't any thrips there, they'll feed on uh, the nectar and pollen in the marigold. We, in this particular case, we also put a uh, lure, a pheromone lure, to see if that enhanced uh, the attractiveness of the plant. Then in the soil, because we know that thrips have a phase in the soil, we put a granular fungal material uh, made from Bovaria bassiana, a well-known thrips insect killing fungus. We put it into the soil so that when the thrips it, the thrips that escape predation that go into the soil, they will hopefully become infected um, by the fungus. Okay, so this just should, gives you an example. We did this in a commercial greenhouse, actually several commercial greenhouses. And on the left, uh, on the right here, you can see this is what the millet looked like. And uh, we, if for this particular trial, we actually produced our own uh, granular fungal formulation. <clears throat> okay. Now this is what we found. So this was again after 12 weeks and we had four different treatments. We had the fungus with mites and the lure. That's one of the black dotted line. We had the fungus with mites and the lure, <clears throat> a different fungus. Uh, again, this is another dotted line. And then this is the gray line is marigolds and lure only and marigold all by itself. So after 12 weeks, this is the number of thrips that were on a whole plant. We had, and this, you gotta realize, this marigold is highly attractive to thrips. So even despite their attractiveness, we were able to maintain the thrips population on that attractive plant um, for 12 weeks at oh, eight or less thrips on average. So the other thing that we found was that less thrips were on flowers of plants with mites. And so the predatory mites were clearly very effective at reducing thrips populations on the marigolds. We, the lures we found were really not terribly effective. Some people mentioned that they believed we had too many lures in the greenhouse for the space and that maybe, uh, that could be true, but our research didn't indicate that the pheromone was very useful. Okay, so then you might say, well, where can I get this fungal stuff? This fungal granular formulation? Well, it is not available commercially. And so we thought maybe you can do it yourself. And so we did some trials where we took dry millet Grain, millet grain, you can get it at the health food store, you can get organic uh, millet, you cook it up, then you dry it, and then you mix it with uh, the fungus. And what you can see in this middle picture is two different ways we did it. We either put the millet in there and then just drenched uh, the pot with a wettable powder drench of Bovaria bassiana, or over here on the left side is when we actually mixed uh, the fungal material with, uh, the, uh, with the millet and then put it in. But what you can see, this white uh, layer there is all the fungus that's growing on the millet, just waiting for the thrips pupae to arrive. So in our trial, we actually uh, put infested bean leaves in these containers. And what we found essentially was more thrips emerged from the pots that were untreated here. And many less thrips emerged from pots treated with either the wettable powder granular mix uh, or even uh, th that worked better than the drench. So that would be this, uh, this treatment was better. Okay, so you could say, 
why bother? Who cares? I can just use a chemical pesticide, can't I? Well, what growers in our region say to me is, you know, Margaret, I use marigolds now. I use natural enemies. And I used to use chemical pesticides. And you know, if the chemical pesticides still worked, I probably would still be using them, but they didn't work for them anymore. And so that forced them to start using, looking elsewhere. And that included using uh, biological control agents. So, so the plant mediated system, it's great because it helps you detect pests and beneficials early because the sooner you start dealing with a, a thrips uh, population, the more that you can reduce the chance of it um, reproducing in high numbers later. It ensures higher quality beneficials um, because you have them right on site. They're used to the environment uh, rather than, you know, when you usually buy most beneficials, they come in from the shipping place and they're feeling pretty, they got jet lag terribly. And so the beauty of this is they start reproducing right on the marigolds. So it provides a sustained source of beneficials over time. It also promotes establishments of local beneficials. Now for us in Vermont, it's pretty cold outside. So that doesn't work very well um, in terms of early in the, in the growing season for a lot of ornamental crops. So you re we really have to rely on commercial uh, commercially produced beneficials, but people farther south can make use of local beneficials and can support them with this whole uh, environment for them. So ultimately it reduces chemical pesticide use and saves money. And just to give you, I'm not just talking, um, one of the largest growers in Vermont has reduced their pesticide use by 80 to 90%. And part of that is because they're using uh, these kind of uh, plant mediated systems. Okay, so now I just wanted to give you one little research teaser here. Um, and we know that marigolds alone and even natural enemies or chemical pesticides, all of these on their own will not be enough you really need to use a multifaceted approach. And that led us to start looking into the use of UV light. It's currently used to manage foliar diseases in like, oh, I think in basil and some other crops, it's been found to be effective. It's also actually used uh, against spider mites and strawberries, but it hasn't really been investigated for use in ornamentals. But so we wondered, is there a way to make it work against thrips? So here's what we've learned so far. UVC radiation indeed killed thrips adults and larvae when we put them in a Petri dish and exposed them to different dosages of radiation. Obviously, just like for humans, the higher the dose, the faster they died. The trouble is those high dosages that killed thrips quickly damaged the plants, at least some of the plant varieties, not all of them, but some of them. And admittedly, most of those plants recovered within two weeks. We did, however, also test um, lower radiation levels. And what we found was that those lower levels killed the thrips, but it took a little bit longer. And when you think of, oh, biological control agents. When you release or spray a biological control agent, it takes time for that to work. We know that, we accept that. And the same may be true with UV radiation, but where it's not over now. Okay, the, what about the next generation? Because as I pointed out early on, uh, one thrips female can turn into 10,000 because of the high rate of reproduction, the high number of eggs that it uh, produces. So we wanted to see whether UV light reduced egg hatch. And now we, thrips females lay their eggs either in the petals of the flowers or in the foliage. 
So, and sometimes on the underside and sometimes on the surface. So you would say, I would say, oh, come on, Bruce. There's no way that the UV light, when you expose a leaf to UV light, that it's going to have enough of an impact on the eggs that are protected inside the foliage. Uh, nope, that wasn't true at all. And this graph shows it. So this shows uh, along the axis um, that, a uh, low, uh, there was a low dose up to the high dose. And obviously this high dose of 3.5, that was enough to cause some damage to the foliage. At 0.5, there was minimal damage if or none. And so we exposed the leaves to these different dosages of UV light. And this information gives you how many eggs hatched from those leaves after exposure. And what you can see is, holy smokes, um, <clears throat> this is the number of eggs. The green, uh, the green bar is how many eggs hatched uh, in the untreated leaves on the undersides. The purple one is uh, the number that uh, emerged from the leaf surface. You can see that even with the lowest dosage, there was almost no egg hatch. That is incredible in terms of that potential. It also could be effective for reducing disease issues as well as uh, insects. So um, we are right now, so what growers might say is, okay, we're gonna get where can I get something like that? I want to start exposing my, uh, my plants. It's too early. We're still in the early stages of figuring out what works best. We do have some students working on devising an apparatus, some engineering students from the University of Vermont. And, <clears throat> and our hope is that we will be able to come up with a prototype pretty soon that will allow the safe application of UVC light on greenhouse ornamentals. And that would involve some kind of um, moving uh, train type of thing that would go down the, the bench and expose the plants along the way that could be adjustable for different heights depending on the height of the plants. So stay tuned, um, it's exciting work and it's just in the very beginning stages. So that is it, and I did it within 30 minutes. So I am happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Margaret, for your presentation. So at this time, if you have any questions, please type those um, in the chat or in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So while you all are typing in your questions, I do have one, uh, Margaret, for you. Um, what are other flowering or bedding plant species that could be used other than marigolds? Could they uh, serve the same purpose? Um, well, that's an interesting question. Um, the, I think growers are very uh, aware of plants that are particularly attractive to thrips. And one of them, oh, the sweet potato vine is one example. But there are lots of different plants that growers know from their own experience. Oh boy, the, if, if I'm gonna have thrips, I always find it on that plant and I always find it in that part of the greenhouse. And so growers can use that information, that personal information on their specific uh, plant uh, growing area to figure out which crops work better, which plants work better or less better. Now, I, I sort of explained one of the reasons, some of the reasons why marigolds are better than a lot of other crop plants. And that's because you can get them to, you want them, you want the plant blooming really quickly. Now, I know that some people uh, swear by chrysanthemums. They're yellow and that's great and they're attractive and they produce pollen and nectar. The trouble is they need, they have some very specific light 
requirements to be able to bloom. And it sometimes takes a long time to get them from the cutting stage up to the blooming stage. That's what's so beautiful about marigolds. You just put them in the ground. In 30 days, you've got the plant. You can put it out there. And if you have to dispose of it when it gets uh, too infested, it's not a big deal because you hopefully have a bunch more all ready to go. All right, well, thank you. So we have a couple of questions that have come in regarding your teaser of the UVC. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and start with the first one. And that is how does the UVC affect biological control agents or BCAs? That, yep, that's biological control agents. Great question. Um, we don't know. First, you know, this is a step-by-step -step process, little by little. We know that we have to answer that question ultimately. Um, just like we need to answer that question for any chemical insecticide use. I sort of see UV light as a non-residual, a non uh, potentially a non-residual uh, treatment similar to an insecticide. Now there's a couple of ways one could go work around it. So uh, just like with a chemical insecticide, if you're gonna use a chemical insecticide, you might say, okay, I'm, going, I'm only going to release the natural enemies after I'm finished that treatment, <clears throat> that insecticide treatment as an added uh, benefit in terms of reducing the pest uh, population. Um, another option is, Let's say you're really focused on marigolds and you have a great population of marigold of natural enemies on your marigolds or other habitat plants that you are uh, nursing along. You could take those out and then you could do your uh, UV light um, assessment or you could do your treatment. But I, but I also realized that ultimately that is one key part of, as an part of an IPM program, that we have to investigate. First, we gotta make sure we can get it to work and work against thrips and that we can make it work in a uh, standard ornamental production area. And then we'll start doing some of these finer points. It's a good question though. All right. So this next question, there's a word in here I'm not sure how to pronounce. So I'm gonna try my best to, uh, to pronounce it. But the question is, are we blocking UV radiation and selective platelins to reduce populations of thrips according to different papers. Will this affect egg hatching? Oh, uh, I, you know, I am aware that some uh, people use plastic, you know, UV light inhibiting uh, plastics to reduce pest problems. And I don't know a lot about it. Um, I, I, I am aware of that conflict, but my sense is there are still thrips, even within greenhouses that have that special plastic. So, but I can't, I can't really answer that question. I'll just, there's one other thing that we're investigating that's sort of outside of what you said, but There is some evidence to suggest that when you expose a plant to UV light, the plant produces chemicals internally that make them more resistant to thrips. And so we're looking at that further as another, so maybe, maybe you, if, if there's a long-term effect of UV light in terms of uh, the resistance of the plant, you could do that and you do it early in the season and then you don't have to do it again. We aren't, we aren't there. We don't know how that works. We don't know the mechanisms, but that's something that um, I hope we'll be able to look at in the future. Okay. And that may answer the next question um, about any news on anti-UV, uh, I guess it would be poly or glazing materials. I, I believe that's this type of question. So you may have hit on that. Wait, wait, so that Sorry, say that. What's that question any, again? Any news on anti-UV polys? Or I assume they're asking for oh. glazing material. Oh, okay. No, I don't have any information about that. I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> and then the next question for you, 
do you observe any onion thrips in greenhouse crops? And the second part is, do the biological or the biocontrol programs work as well for onion thrips as for Western flower thrips? Ooh, so uh, that's a great question, Rose. Uh, I, I would love to hear from other, <laughs> other, um, other people on this, other growers, are you having onion thrips problems? Or maybe you don't even know if you have onion thrips because you always assumed they were Western flower thrips. Um, so my, my gut, we haven't worked on onion thrips except in the field and only with <clears throat> insect killing fungi. So, oh, uh, I don't, so I don't know. I, I think there's every reason to assume that a predatory mite that feeds on Western flower thrips will also attack uh, onion thrips. I think probably a fungus that, attack, that is effective against thrips, Western flower thrips will also be effective against onion thrips. But don't quote me on that. I think, you know, what I said in the very beginning is what we do at the entomology lab is we try and meet the needs and the questions of growers. If growers said, we're having a terrible time with onion thrips and we don't know, and it doesn't seem, and all the stuff that we're doing isn't working. If we learn that from growers, we would say, okay, we need to start testing that and um, get a better handle on that issue. So. I say that partly because I'm assuming that a lot of the participants are actually growers and you're the ones that drive the focus of our research. And so you need to make your needs known. Rose, I didn't really answer that question very well, <laughs> but as soon as you figure it out, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Always good for collaboration. And I have another question. So we keep on getting questions, which I think is great. So the next one for you is high temperatures inside the greenhouses affect the effectiveness of Bavaria bassiana? Yes. So to be honest, in all the research that we have ever done, <clears throat> we haven't found fungi to be, well, we haven't found Bovaria bassiana to be terribly effective against Western flower thrips. And when we, I take that back, when, when we applied, whenever we have applied it as a foliar spray, it just didn't meet our expectations. And um, I think there are all sorts of reasons, maybe heat, I think more likely it's the humidity issues and UV light because uh, UV light will kill spores very quickly. That's why developing strategies to use fungi in the soil is great because that eliminates those key uh, climatic factors that limit their effectiveness. Of course, it's not, not all the thrips that are in the foliage drop down into the soil. Probably a lot of them do, but not all of them do. And so you're never going to get all of the thrips. If, if you focus your fungus on the soil only, now if you focus your management of thrips on the soil, you won't be able to completely manage the the pest. That's why it's knowing that there's a foliar stage and a soil phase allows you to target both of those environments to be effective. So I agree, it's not very effective when you use it in the foliage. I think that's what I think that's what you meant. <clears throat> okay. Well, and just to and when you're targeting the soil, the soil is cooler than, um, than the foliage. And so that would increase the effectiveness. 
I, okay. And you can use a drench. Oh, I know there's one other thing that I didn't mention. So we tested, when we tested our plant, our habitat plants with the fungus and the predatory mites and the lure, <clears throat> we use the fungus in the soil. There are other biological control agents that are known to be effective against thrips pupae in the soil. There are predatory mites that are specific to um, the soil. There are <clears throat> nematodes that can be very effective in the soil. Um, so if you say, oh, well, I don't have the fungus. Well, then you can try some of these other things uh, instead. Okay. You actually answered my next question. I was wondering if there was other soil or substrate or soilless media organisms that would work well with the fungus. So thank you for answering that question for me. So it doesn't appear that any more questions are coming in through the Q&A chat. So with that, we're going to go Wait, ahead and- Can I oh. just say one other thing? Go I ahead. Have a, I have a question. I'd like to know how many people that are on this call have used marigolds in their cropping systems. How many of those 20 of you that are still on? So maybe we can get some responses in the, the Q&A chat. Well, part of the reason I asked that, we went to a, oh, a grower event just recently. And um, this is in Vermont, admittedly. And we do a lot of promoting of marigold systems in, uh, in our area. And when we asked that question, we were amazed that probably, I don't know, 75 or 80 percent of the 25 or 30 people that were at that session use either um, marigolds or uh, alyssum to um, create habitats that are good for natural enemies and for pollinators for that matter. <clears throat> so did they, did any, nobody answer? No, no responses. <sighs> Maybe next time, next time for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mark, thank you. He, he <laughs> thank you, Mark. You get an A plus. <laughs> no marigolds? Okay, well, try the marigolds next. It's so easy. Great. And I hope the next time we have an opportunity to meet, you will say that you have tried it as a result of this. All right, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and close out today's session. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for another session on thrips and botrytis research. If you have any additional questions or would like more information, please contact AFE's research coordinator, Dr. Carol A. Nell at tnell at afeendowment.org. Again, that is T-N-E-L-L -L at afeendowment.org. For future research updates and other floral industry resources, please visit endowment.org. Once again, these presentations and materials are copyrighted and should not be distributed or published without AFE written permission. The video series will not be released to the public until 2022. Sponsors and supporters will have access to the edited video recordings at the end of the series. I would like to remind everyone that the Spanish session uh, will be held on Thursday, October 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern for thrips and on Tuesday, October 26th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Registration links will be dropped in the chat, so please check your chat and register for both sessions. We ask that you please complete a brief survey about today's session. Your feedback will help as we continue to improve our webinars and how we present this research in the future. Thank you again for joining us today, and we hope that you have a great day.